have Shannon, our vice president, come up next to introduce our speaker for the day. Andy Beshear is Kentucky's 50th Attorney General. Prior to being elected, Andy spent more than a decade in private practice where he was recognized as one of the best lawyers in America four consecutive years. In his first year as Attorney General, Andy has tirelessly fought Kentucky's most pressing problems. Under his direction, the Office of the Attorney General has removed a record number of child predators from Kentucky communities fought the drug epidemic by pursuing heroin and fentanyl dealers and by funding 15 substance abuse centers through an 8.5 million settlement, created a transformational communication tool to protect seniors against scams, funded the end of the rape kit backlog, and returned or, or saved Kentuckians and the state almost $300 million. Please make welcome General Andy Bashir. I always think, thank you for the kind introduction, it, almost like I wrote it myself. I, um, I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, folks, my name is Andy Bashir, uh, and I am truly honored to serve as your Attorney General. Uh, aside from my family and my faith, this job has given me more purpose than I could have ever asked for uh, in life. And I think that's because when I get up to go to work every day, uh, I'm excited because I don't feel like I'm going to do a job. I feel like I'm going to serve a mission. You know, mission is something that my granddad, who was a primitive Baptist minister down the road in Dawson Springs, uh, Kentucky, uh, taught me a lot about. My mission's pretty simple, and I think it's one that's shared by many of you. I think that every Kentucky family, including every family right here in Ohio County, deserves to live in a safe neighborhood and have a real path to prosperity. But what does that mean? You hear phrases like that from elected officials a lot. I'll tell you what it means. A safe neighborhood is a neighborhood free from violence, free from abuse. But a safe neighborhood is also a neighborhood free from drugs. And a real path to prosperity first isn't just a chance to get a job, but a good job. A good job in your region where you can leave your kids a little bit better off than you had it. But we also know that there are so many impediments, so many obstacles to that path to prosperity. We know that children who suffer from abuse will have a hard time achieving that prosperity because of the trauma. We know that victims of violent crime will have a real hard time achieving that prosperity because of the trauma. We know that victims of domestic violence will have a hard time establishing needed independence at that stage and reaching that level of prosperity. So in the Attorney General's office, we show up uh, to try to serve this mission, and I truly believe that we are servants and public servants that pursue that mission by addressing four challenges that can impact any Kentucky family. They are the prevention and prosecution of child abuse, better protecting our seniors against scams and abuse. We have a wonderful partner in AARP that we work day in and day out on that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, seeking justice for victims of primarily rape and sexual assault, and then finding workable solutions to this drug epidemic, which I know uh, has hit this county, but every other county in Kentucky uh, so hard. It fills up our legal dockets. It uh, causes so much strife. And I wanted to start by spending just a few minutes uh, talking about what I believe has been uh, some good work we've done in these areas, some things this Attorney General's office has worked on that uh, might not be some of the things that have, that have made the news. So in the area of preventing uh, and prosecuting child abuse, I'm so proud of the hard work of our Cyber Crimes Unit. Uh, our first year in office and last year, in each of them consecutively, we nearly tripled the number of child sex offenders we removed from Kentucky communities. That makes this community safe. It makes every community safer. Uh, when you add up our number of indictments, convictions, and <clears throat> arrests, it's over 145 with four active detectives working it every single day. Now, these are people that go online trying to stalk our children, that then travel sometimes 30, 50, 70 miles and show up thinking that they are going to pay to traumatize a child forever. And the people that we've removed are dangerous people that needed to be removed. They included a Southern Indiana minister whose wife used to work at my church. 
They included a U of L professor who had babysat kids right down the street from me. And so as the dad of a seven and an eight year old, when I talk about this making your community and my community safer uh, for our kids, uh, I truly mean it and I've truly seen it. Um, but we understand that the best thing we can do for our children, for your children and grandchildren, is to make sure they never have to experience this type of abuse. So we work on prevention every single day. Uh, we launched the state's most comprehensive, cohesive uh, child sexual abuse prevention training uh, that we've ever seen. It started in year one with us training over 1,600 people in every area development district about how to recognize the signs of these predators, what it looks like when they're trying to groom a family to gain access to a child, and what it looks like when they're trying to groom a child to gain his or her confidence so that when the folks we train in your community see these signs, they can step in and do something about it. Because all these children are children of God equal in his or her eyes and none of them are responsible for the situation they've been placed in. And as responsible adults, we are not just, uh, we don't just owe duties to our children, but we owe duties to all children, especially uh, those that are facing these types of, of circumstances. And as a dad, that meant a lot to me before becoming AG, um, but since becoming AG, seeing some of these people show up and having kids in the back seat, having rescue victims of human trafficking. Uh, we see what one brave person making one phone call can do. Somebody just seeing something that is out of the ordinary, making a call, and that call is the difference in between a person continuing to suffer from horrific abuse or having a real shot at life. And it's a difficult life, what you've been through, but having a real shot uh, at life. Right now, our training's expanded. We're focused on youth-serving organizations. So think about your kids and your grandkids and how many different organizations they go through every single day. I got to see your middle school and, and you all are doing a fantastic job. <laughs> After school programs, church, youth sports, you keep naming them. Uh, there are so many different groups our kids go through. But not all of them have the best practices and procedures in place that we know can limit the opportunities for these predators to gain access to them. So we're traveling around the state doing half day seminars that allow any group that comes in to leave that day with the types of policies that we know can protect children. And our third iteration of the training, which is coming up, is about reporting. Is about us having the training that we need so in what is potentially that child's most important moment in their life, when they're gonna to disclose to an adult that thing that's happening to them that we know how to react <coughs> in a way that not only seeks justice for that child, but puts them on a path <coughs> towards healing and we're very excited about that training because we can't get any of those situations wrong we have to be there for each one of those children part of preventing and prosecuting child abuse uh, requires addressing human trafficking human trafficking is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world uh, and it comes in two forms it comes in labor trafficking and sex trafficking sex trafficking occurs in every single county every single region every single um, city across Kentucky and the average age of recruitment is 12 to 14 years old. You take just the month of February in Kentucky, and it shows you not only how prevalent it is here, but also how we are really starting uh, to make strides in addressing it. So early in February, we accepted a guilty plea from a former district judge in northern Kentucky. 21 felonies, 19 victims, most all of them high school age girls or younger for human trafficking. If that sentence goes through, which I believe it will, um, uh, later this month, it will be the longest human trafficking sentence uh, ever given for just state level charges. And we believe that there's more to come in that situation. Move forward a couple days, and we indicted uh, a Kansas man in Franklin Circuit Court. He wanted to fly to Kentucky to try to buy an 11 year old child. You want to know what he thought was the going rate for that? $250 and as much meth as he could bring. A couple days after that, working with some local law enforcement, we arrested a 22-year-old and a 50-year-old that were trafficking two 16-year-old girls in downtown Louisville. And then during the farm machinery show, uh, we helped execute the largest sting uh, focused on human trafficking that we've seen in Kentucky. Over two nights, we made 17 arrests. Do you want to know how many of those 17 were people from out of state that had come in? 
Zero. So we work hard every single day knowing that there are threats to the people that we hold dear and that it is our job to protect the most vulnerable uh, every single day. We're committed uh, and we're committed to offering the training in every region to make sure that your children are the best, uh, are safeguarded as well as in any other place in Kentucky. But we also see threats to the other side of our families, our parents and our grandparents. Folks, we have never seen the amount of scams that we see right now. You all know this, just answer your phone. <clears throat> While we're sitting here, somebody's cell phone will ring and it will have your area code plus the first three digits of your cell phone. That's a scam. They're cloning your number and they believe that if you see your area code plus the first three digits of your number, you're gonna trust it and you're gonna pick up. Last year, Consumer Reports estimates that our seniors in the United States lost over $3 billion in scams. And if you broaden that to elder financial abuse, it's over $37 billion. It is a huge criminal enterprise and it is attacking people who have done it right, who have saved for retirement, who deserve to age with dignity. And they're using technology to prey on us. How many people have gotten a phone call and when they pick it up, there's just a click and nobody's there? That's because somebody's using a robocall machine, likely a con artist, and someone picked up before you. How many people have gotten a call on your cell phone or your home phone line and it has your area code and you pick up and you are 100% certain that that call did not come from your area code? That's because they're cloning your number. And if you've picked up, how many people have talked to someone that knows a lot of information about them? Their name, where they live, generally their age, maybe the name of your grandkids that you know don't know you. That's because there's more information out there on you and I than there ever has been uh, before. And if you get far enough into that conversation, after they tell you that you need to go out and purchase a certain amount of gift cards, they're gonna give you the cross streets for your local pharmacy or Walmart to make it sound like they know your community because they've got Google Maps, just like everybody else. And so we saw this problem and we saw AARP valiantly fighting against it with their fraud watch. But we wanted to team with them and others and use technology to fight back. So we launched Scam Alerts, which is this state's first direct text, direct email scam warning system, where we can send directly to your phone or your email information on the trickiest and trending scams uh, that are out there. We have over 175 partners, some cities, counties, and others that have joined us to try to make sure that no one ever falls for that scam uh, in the first place. What we do is we send out a text or an email every two weeks uh, with the newest or the trickiest one that's out there. Some of you all might have seen uh, in the newspaper that a Hazard Kentucky hotel just lost $6,000 to a scam. It was a utility scam. You all know how that goes? They call and they know your local utility. For them it was Kentucky Power. They said they'd missed a number of payments there's a $6,000 bill and they were already past the time, so they're going to shut off their electricity. This hotel is thinking, wait a minute, you shut off our electricity, we shut down, we lose revenue for that entire period. And they paid the $6,000. It's just the same as a, a family being called, a senior most likely saying, you missed a payment on your IRS and we got somebody that's coming out to arrest you. <laughs> or you missed jury service. That's a serious offense, there's a bench warrant for you and we've got somebody coming out uh, to arrest you. Or on the flip side, you've won a sweepstakes, <coughs> life-changing money. We can't just send that to you. We need you to send us something to bond and insure it. Everybody's won a free cruise, right? That one is, is, is out there. Or two free nights at a resort because you've been staying um, at that resort. It is so important for us to get as many people signed up for scam alerts as possible. So we sit here right now a year and a half in. We're at nearly 17,500 people. And here's what that lets us do. Those 17,500, we want to make sure they don't fall for a scam, but we want them to be nerve centers. We want them to be committed to being their brother and sister's keeper. The idea that just by having this information, the next time they sit down to lunch and somebody tells them a story about their most recent call or email or person that showed up in their driveway, if that's a scam, they can recognize it and protect that person from losing their life savings. It's just about coming together uh, as a community. And if we can do it right, if we can truly get people signed up, and if we're committed as a community to making sure our neighbor doesn't fall for a scam, two things will happen. You know, number one, you won't have seniors in your community 
uh, that struggle and, and have to figure out how to make ends meet. But number two, they'll stop calling because they're calling our area codes and they get the analytics because they know they can make money here. But if we're the best prepared, if we have the most people signed up to get the right information, then we can truly make these folks stop calling us. Now we've got a ways to go to get there, uh, but I believe it's possible. In seeking justice uh, for victims of rape and sexual assault, we've got to admit that we have a cultural problem in this country, and we have a cultural problem in this state. And we've had it a long time before the Me Too movement or anything else that you've read about. Our statistics in Kentucky are unacceptable. They suggest that nearly one in two Kentucky women will face some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. Nearly one in two. I'm a son, I'm a husband, I'm a dad of a seven-year-old girl, and I will not accept a state, a reality, where our people face that much risk. So we go to work every day in the AG's office trying to change culture. And for us, it started with the rape kit backlog. Have you all read about that? It's a national shame. Each one of these kits is so much more than a box on a shelf, which is what you'd see um, on the news. It's the visual. It represents a victim, a survivor, of one of the most underreported crimes that reported it, and then was willing to undergo one of the most invasive forensic exams you could ever ask someone to take. These are people whose, whose bodies have been violated, and we're asking them to undergo an exam where their body's the crime scene and it takes hours. We know it further traumatizes them, but we need it to seek justice. For over 3,100 people who made that, who had that courage, who underwent that exam, we locked that courage in a box, we put it on a shelf, and we never tested the kit. There are different reasons, but none of them in the end should have kept those kits from being tested. Now, this is a national problem. It didn't just happen here in Kentucky. But the way we've addressed it in Kentucky is almost unprecedented. You know, two years ago when I came into office, we hadn't had the first kit tested. But as we sit here today, every single one has at least been through an outside lab for the first round of testing. All 3,100. We've had our first <laughs> indictment out of it of someone that we know is a uh, serial rapist. But it's not enough. I mean, if we're looking at changing culture, just getting them tested isn't enough. But I will tell you um, that the second step was making sure that it never happens again. And it won't. And it won't for two reasons. Number one was the last bipartisan bill I saw go through the legislature, though I think we have one or two this session, and I'm happy to see that. What that last piece of legislation called the SAFE Act did is it creates strict guidelines, requirements, uh, numbers of days to get a kid in, numbers of days that it has to come back. But the other reason we'll never have a backlog was a day that we came into my office with a computer just like this, and we had a survivor come in. She pressed a button and four and a half million dollars was transferred to your state police crime lab. It was every single dime they said they needed to hire more people, train them, and buy more equipment, and none of it was your tax dollars. We had won it in a settlement. It was a settlement on a, on a different pharmaceutical company. But because that money has been transferred, there is literally now no excuse. Every single dollar, every single person, uh, the laws and the rules are now in place, and we should never see that backlog again. But it's still not enough, because we still had 3,100 people that, while their kits had finally been <coughs> tested in the first round, they hadn't secured justice. And I still believe in justice. So one of the greatest days I've had as Attorney General is when we got to announce a $3 million grant from the U.S. Department of Justice. That $3 million grant has created a cold case unit inside the Attorney General's office to work with local prosecutors and law enforcement. It has a dedicated investigator, prosecutor, and victim's advocate. And you know what their sole job is? To work on those backlog cases. And I'll admit that gives me chills because the folks whose kits weren't tested, the justice system let them down. Their case may have sat 20 or 30 years. They didn't necessarily have a voice in the system, and now they have a dedicated unit to make sure their case uh, is looked into, that the evidence is re-looked at, and where we can seek a conviction, we are absolutely 
going to, to do it. There's something else that Grant does. So even with those 3,100 kits out there, there were still a couple that didn't qualify under the parameters they set up for an audit, which is something you do. Some of them are called boomerang kits for different reasons. That uh, grant gave us enough money to where we can test every single one of those uncounted kits. It means hopefully by the end of this year, our total number of untested rape kits in Kentucky will be zero with no asterisks and no exceptions. And we may be the first state to get there. And while I, I'm excited about that, the real reason I'm excited about that is because it's the right thing to do. But it's been a lot of people coming together and you know, sometimes you face the challenges that shouldn't have existed. But the way we've gone about it, I think shows the way we ought to address our problems here in Kentucky. But that leads me to our drug epidemic. I don't have to tell you how bad it is. Every single person here has probably lost someone that they love and care about. They probably lost someone in their neighborhood. We lose four Kentuckians every single day to a fatal overdose. I experienced it before I became Attorney General when roughly a year before, a neighbor son, eight houses down, died of a fatal overdose. It was the first time he tried heroin and his friends, while he was overdosing, took his wallet, took his car keys, stole his car, and left him on a driveway to die. And his 16-year-old sister, who'd ridden her bike since she was 11, the five years I'd lived there, back and forth in front of our house, and asked to figure out what the world means. And how do you move on? And why does this happen to us? Why does it happen uh, to anyone? It is the single greatest threat to the lives of the people of Kentucky. And let me tell you, it's not political at all. The drug epidemic doesn't care if you're a Democrat or Republican or an independent, it will kill you just the same. And the drugs that are out there are scarier than anything we could have ever imagined. I would have told you three years ago that heroin was the scariest thing that, that we could see, not even close. Every day there are synthetic heroines that we learn about, like fentanyl, 50 times more powerful than heroin, or carfentanil, more than 100 times more powerful than heroin. They use carfentanil just to fleck to anesthetize an elephant, and people put it in their veins. Just by contact, we've had law enforcement uh, overdose. Our kids are now truly growing up at a time they shouldn't have to face, where one bad mistake can mean the end of life. But it's not just the lives, it's our families. I mean, our, we've never had more broken families than we do right now, more kids in foster care and kinship care than ever before, and drugs are uh, the driving cause. Some people having lost their parents for drugs, other people, having their parents lose their ability to be parents because of, of drugs. And while I'm so proud, especially, of our tens of thousands of grandparents that have stepped up uh, for their families, we have to understand those kids have still experienced trauma, even if they have a loving grandparent that's there to, to help them. And then it's our single greatest threat to job growth across this Commonwealth. They talk a lot about job growth and uh, what legislation is needed or not needed in Frankfurt, and they argue a lot about it, but I will tell you that it's not going to matter if our people aren't healthy enough to fill the jobs that are out there. We've got major employers across this state that can't fill jobs that are out there because people can't pass a drug test for long enough. There's a Somerset auto parts supplier that had to fire 41 people in one shift because the drug test came back. There's an Eastern Kentucky mayor who can't get their Walmart to upgrade because they don't believe she can find 100 workers in a five county radius that can pass a drug test for three weeks. This is the question that new employers are going to be asking each and every one of us when they look anywhere in the country, but especially in Kentucky. And it's absolutely critical. If we want the jobs that I want to be available for my kids in this Commonwealth, that we get ahead of this drug crisis. So in the AG's office, we work on it in a number of ways. On the law enforcement side, we go after the worst of the worst dealers, those fentanyl and carfentanil dealers, the people who are truly dealing death. Uh, and we've had some, some good arrests. I don't know if you all remember about a year and a half, two years ago, there was that series of overdoses that started uh, in West Virginia, and then moved to Mount Sterling, and then moved to Louisville, and then moved up to Cincinnati. I think we had close to 100 overdoses on one bad batch of fentanyl. Uh, we ended up catching a pretty high-level drug dealer with the, with the work of the DEA as well. He's never going to see the outside of a jail cell again. I think we have over 13 deaths attributable to that one uh, bad batch. And I'm proud of our Kentuckians because what I've learned is if 12 people overdose in Mount Sterling, somebody's going to talk to the cops. And that helped us get uh, that arrest. 
On the treatment side, so we have folks out there that we love and care about. People who are addicted are our friends and family members and neighbors. They may have made one or two bad decisions, but they need our help. The problem is that in every region, we need a treatment center for men, for women, for adolescents. We need a 12-step, and we need one of the right medically-assisted treatment facilities, and there are a lot that aren't. But right now, we don't see that in every region. So we're glad we've done our part providing that eight and a half million to 15 drug treatment centers all across Kentucky and to watch the work that they've done just with seed money. We kept one center in Eastern Kentucky open that was otherwise closing. It's a women's treatment facility, one of the only ones in Eastern Kentucky. They took that money and not only stayed open, they're now insurance eligible, meaning they can treat more people now than ever before. We had two facilities that work with uh, pregnant addicts. And I always thought of treatment and recovery as being one miracle at a time. Not with these women. You know, it's two miracles or maybe even three miracles uh, at a time. And we've seen more healthy babies uh, because of that funding. Uh, but we need more as we keep going. Then there's the prevention side. Uh, we launched a pilot program called the Kentucky Opioid Disposal Program that I hope uh, we can bring here at some point to Ohio County. We just dropped some off. Uh, in Owensboro, GRAD is going to be uh, getting them out in uh, senior centers across the region. The Kentucky Opioid Disposal Program addresses what is truly uh, the supply of drugs that we can impact. So we know a couple things. Number one, 80% of people using heroin right now, how do you think they became addicted? Prescription pills. But where do you think those prescription pills came from? Everybody says a doctor. Yes, they all came from a doctor. Whose doctor? <coughs> Not theirs. So for 70% of people who are abusing prescription pills, it's pills they've taken or bought from a friend or a family member. It shows that the most dangerous place in each and every one of our homes is the medicine cabinet. And I think back, I've, I've tried to be a good dad. I think back to when we had kids. And I determined I was going to make my house the safest it could be for those kids. So I went out and I bought all those plugs for the electric outlets and learned I have a lot of electric outlets. And I anchored all of our furniture. And I grew up on a horse farm. I anchored something that it would take a large horse to pull over. But I never cleaned out the medicine cabinet. It's the number one reason your house would be robbed. And it's the number one way your kids or grandkids or anybody else, even if they steal it, could become addicted. But what do you do? If you want to clean out your medicine cabinet, where do you take it? Because please don't flush it down the toilet. We have counties that are detecting opioids in their water treatment system. Where do you take it? Well, most hospitals won't take it back. Most pharmacies won't take it back. But in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have an announcement that I'm pretty excited about that I hope is just the start of that changing. And sheriff's offices have a drop box, but let's face it, we have a lot of seniors who have a lot of medication that can't necessarily get there. And who wants to be seen in your community shoveling a whole bunch of uh, uh, pill bottles into that uh, drop box? So the Kentucky Opioid Disposal Program in our four pilot program counties of Perry, Floyd, uh, Henderson, and McCracken is providing drug deactivation pouches. It's how you can impact the drug epidemic in less than a minute. All you do with these pouches that are less than a pound is tear off the top, pour up to 45 prescription uh, pills in, fill it halfway with water, wait 30 seconds, cinch it up, drop it in your trash. At that point, they're totally deactivated. You could drink the water, but I wouldn't. Uh, and they're 100% environmentally friendly. That bag will even biodegrade um, in, in the dump. That's how you make sure that you don't have it in your water treatment system. And it's how we start truly impacting the supply that's out there. And just think. Think about the possibility of every family cleaning out their medicine cabinet. And then think about the opportunity if every time you got one of these dangerous prescriptions, you got the means to destroy it after you took two or three, because even with the new laws, they give you way too many. We could truly impact the supply that we know is driving new addiction, and that would reduce, if not reverse, the rate of new addiction. So it's given me as much hope, that program, as I've had uh, fighting this this scourge. But the other thing we're doing is we're holding these multinational drug companies that have made billions upon billions of dollars on a product they knew was addictive and dangerous and was only meant for end-of-life care. 
that they flooded your communities with, telling people even with chronic headaches they ought to take, we're going to hold them accountable. Last one I sued in the last three months alone made $33 billion. It's a company called Amerisource Bergen. That's just one third of their year. And roughly 30% of every pill that came into Kentucky came through them. So when oh, 17 million pills went into one Eastern Kentucky County population, 38,000, they knew it. 17 million just from them. And they just had a third of the market. That's what, six, 700 for every man, woman, and child? in that county. But do you think they followed the law and told the DEA there's a problem? No. Do you think they stopped the order? They call themselves a health care company. No. They counted their billions while we suffered and addiction grew and accidental addiction grew. So I believe they've got a responsibility. I don't believe in punishment. I believe in responsibility and accountability. So if they're unwilling and right now they are, we're going to drag every single one of them into a Kentucky court. So they have to look at your families and explain their actions. And we're filing these all around Kentucky because every region deserves to have one of these cases in your courtroom because every region of Kentucky has been significantly impacted. And no amount of money we recover is ever going to bring back somebody that we've lost. And it's never going to be enough for anybody that we've lost. But what it does do is give us an opportunity uh, to save a generation going forward. Those that have made billions of dollars off their product can at least spend millions uh, to ultimately counteract those incredibly negative impacts uh, that they've had. We do a few other things in the Attorney General's office, and, and I may save those for, for questions. Um, I'm the Chief Constitutional Lawyer for Kentucky. My duty is number one to that Constitution, number two to you, and only after that to the legislature or any other portion of government. It's why I'm on record as saying if they pass this current pension bill, uh, I will sue. Because the Supreme Court has said that it's the Attorney General's job <coughs> to step up and do that when a bill is unconstitutional or illegal, and that one is. I've tried to let the legislature know early about it, and I've tried to tell them that you don't break a promise to teachers and public servants who have spent decades, decades serving uh, our families. Uh, they didn't want to listen initially, but they certainly listened when a thousand teachers and public employees showed up at the Capitol. One of the greatest examples of democracy that I have ever seen. I mean, it was truly inspiring because your government's supposed to serve you. And for that day, uh, they certainly uh, did. So I, I got to tell you, I, I love being your Attorney General. And I hope when you see our work, if you look past all the back and forth that creates the drama uh, that, that uh, some people want to want to post or see, uh, that you see somebody and you see an office, because there are 200 people that show up every day in the AG's office to do the right thing, uh, that maybe has made your family and your community uh, just a little bit safer. I'm happy to take uh, any questions you've got. There's got to be one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sorry, grandparents raising grandchildren. I think yeah. the county we're right at 55% in schools probably one way or the other, uh, legally, you've got grandkids. What, what is your office primarily doing for that? You know, we are um, working on some of it with, with you. We just did an event um, a couple days ago. Uh, so our grandparents faced um, such challenges. You know, they never, none of us ever expected this many children, this many children to need our help. And grandparents have stepped up, but uh, unlike kids in foster care, unless they're in the grandparent foster care system, which lasts a little bit, don't get a stipend. And they're suffering, they're, they're facing the same costs that foster families do. And they save for their retirement, but nobody planned to be raising two of their kids' kids. And the other thing that concerns me significantly is that while in foster care you have access to services, because those children have experienced abandonment, whether, whether it's through addiction and the parent wished it didn't happen, but they're, but they're facing those issues. In foster care, you can get some services, but in regular kinship care right now, the grandparent has to pay for those services, and that's a generation of folks that we need to make sure is getting the help that they need. Now, we need to reinstitute the kinship care system in full. Uh, now that we are out of the international recession, uh, that's just something that we absolutely uh, have to do. And then our work with you and you do great work with AARP in making sure that those grandparents don't have their life savings scammed out from under them 
when not only are they supporting themselves, but their grandkids and others, I mean, it's more important than it has ever been. And, and you and I have talked to so many seniors who've had $100,000. $100,000, it's not unusual to have that uh, stolen out from, from under them. We've got to make sure that whatever is there, uh, that they can keep. Our hope, my hope, is that the federal government, um, which is making some noise on um, the opioid crisis, uh, will uh, come through in one area. Uh, the president declared a national health emergency, which I appreciate. He's the first president that's declared a national health emergency uh, on it. But the national health emergency doesn't come with any funding. It comes with awareness, and that's good. But if a national emergency is declared, and we are facing something as significant, as any uh, weather emergency we've ever faced, it could come with billions of dollars of funding. And we know what that could do to help our communities. So I'm still encouraging uh, there. I know that there are others in both parties that are encouraging there, and I hope that's something that, that we'll see. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the robo <coughs> Yes. Is there anything being done to put pressure on the carrier? Yes. Keep these calls from coming through. Uh, we're working federally uh, on that. Uh, when I first came in, it was actually going the other way. So carriers had a bill that almost went, no, it was, it was uh, a regulation change with the FCC that almost went through that would have allowed unlimited robocalls. And these are from non-scammers, non though sometimes we view the, the legitimate robocalls as scammers, to your cell phone, unlimited, as long as it went directly to voicemail. Well, two AGs thought that was a really terrible idea, Massachusetts uh, and me, and we won. And that's, and that, and that's pretty exciting. Um, so the technology uh, on our infrastructure, on, on communications, on our phones, is more complicated than uh, I could have ever uh, imagined. And we are working through it. A lot of it is a cat and a mouse game in that you, you create new technology to stop them, and they create new technology to get around it. But we should, at some point, reach a place where these carriers can block it. I am supporting uh, a federal bill that would remove some old restrictions on them before this was happening that gives them a greater ability to block calls uh, for you. And there is some okay software, uh, if you have an iPhone or others that you can download that'll, that'll get some of them off. But what I wanna make sure is, even when we recommend that, that people know that they get around it, that you can't be comfortable with the calls that are coming in. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I greatly appreciate the opportunity. All right. Thank you for much for the, so much for the information that was provided. Uh, it's very interesting. Up next, we have a presentation that we're going to make uh, with AARP. Uh, we'll give you the floor. Thank you uh, so much, uh, General Brashear, for coming to Ohio County. We're always honored to have you. Um, I especially am uh, impressed with what you're doing on the line of veterans and yes. fraud issues. It seems to be a group of people that are being uh, focused on more by the scammers right now than anyone else. And yes. I appreciate, I'll be joining Lori and some of your staff with some of those presentations. And I appreciate that, um, especially for all of our seniors and veterans in Ohio County. Um, Becky? You know, when we hear a comment uh, from someone, or when we even make a comment, you never know when it's going to be a lasting comment and a comment that's just going to stick in your head. Well, last fall, Becky's husband uh, spoke to our, our chamber, and the comment he made was, in a given day, possibly a thousand children would be hungry in Ohio County on a given day. And that has really bothered me. <laughs> but it also made me think, if there are a thousand children, there could be a thousand seniors as well. They can't get here to eat. You know, we have over probably 40, 50 on a waiting list for meals here, home delivered meals, 150 in Owensboro. We, I expect the legislature not to make any cuts in those programs, and I've told them so. We'll see what happens this week. But um, 
when <laughs> this became a burden to me, I went to our AARP Executive Director, Mr. Bridges, who's in the Louisville office, and I shared with him my concern about my own county, that we had a lot of needs here in Ohio County. With that said, he came up with, uh, this says 800, but it's actually going to be a thousand dollar check to our Ohio County Food Pantry. So, uh, right. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to Charlotte and thank you to AARP for doing this. This is tremendous to us. Anything and everything we get goes to feed our seniors, our children, um, adults in the community that are hungry. So we appreciate everybody that, that helps us. Well, and she shared with me with our $1,000 uh, commitment here, she could very well serve 7,000 meals. So that is huge, and um, we're just happy to do this. And thank you, Becky. You are the number one nonprofit in this county. So let's give her a hand.